The following program is a production of Pioneer Public Television. Meet the Candidates is brought to you by Pioneer Public Television. The next hour is intended to encourage, debate, and educate you, the viewer, about the candidates running for office. The end result is for voters to be able to make an informed decision on Election Day. Participate in the process by sending in your questions now. The candidates for Minnesota House District 17B are Mary Sawatsky, a DFLer from Wilmer, and Dave Baker, Republican of Wilmer. Welcome back to Pioneer Public Television's Meet the Candidates. I am the moderator for tonight's program, Amy Dahl Wallers. This is your opportunity to get to know your local candidates, to ask them questions, and to participate in the debates. The candidates tonight are from House District 17B, and let's briefly meet those candidates. First, we have Mary Sawatsky, the Democrat from Wilmer. Welcome, Mary. And then we have Dave Baker, a Republican, also from Wilmer. Welcome, Dave. Thank you. And in a moment, we'll be looking at the map for House District 17B, and then we will come back for opening statements, and then you will have an opportunity to call in with your questions. Please make sure your questions are geared towards both candidates and are really directed towards a single candidate. We'll try and get through as many questions as we can this evening. So let's take a look now at House District 17B map. Minnesota State House District 17B includes most of Candy, Ohio County. Some of the cities in this district are Wilmer, Spicer, and New London. Talking to the camera. Welcome back. So now we're going to start with our three-minute opening remarks for each candidate, and then we will take a short break while you call in your questions and our volunteers write those questions down for us. So starting this evening with the re opening remarks, we have Dave Baker. Dave? Good evening, and thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, um, my name is Dave Baker, and I have lived in the Wilmer area, uh, Candioy County area, for 20 years. have uh, been a business owner for the last 14 years, and I own and operate Baker Hospitalities, incorporated with my wife, Mary. been married uh, 29 years. We've had three beautiful children, and um, we love living in our area of Candioy County. We've made it our home, and obviously with our investments and our businesses, we've really enjoyed um, uh, making that our, our very special home. In my career, uh, we currently own some businesses in the Wilmer area. We have, um, I've had the ability to actually get on some state boards and state uh, associations, and I've learned a lot of things about how Minnesota works. And I felt that um, as, the, as the session the last couple of years have gone along, and as my working on state boards like the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce, the Minnesota Restaurant Association, some local boards, and, and uh, Municipal Utilities Corporation and, com and commissioner, commissions, I feel that um, I've got a unique perspective on how things work on a bigger uh, arena. And I was very concerned over the last couple of years how things were going. The priorities were not, I felt, right for Minnesota. And so I decided this might be a great time for me to step in and to uh, actually do something. I've always been someone in my company and as well as my life that if you really want to do something, don't complain about it. Stand up, do something about it, and why don't you either put up or shut up. And so I decided I wasn't happy. I had talked to uh, my opponent on many occasions, and I felt not heard. And so I thought, well, Dave, this is your chance. So I decided to run for office. This is my first go at it. I'm ex super excited about it. The journey has been amazing. Talking to so many people at the doors and uh, at the parades and so many other activities and events, I'm really looking forward to uh, the final three weeks, uh, looking forward to a good race um, at the very end, and I'm looking forward to uh, hopefully serving as your representative in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. And next, Mary Swatsky will give her opening remarks. Mary? Good evening. Thank you all for joining in tonight and learning a little bit more about your candidates for 17B. I'm Mary Swatsky, and I'm running for House of Representatives, and I'm running to capitalize on the work we completed in these past two years. When I was elected two years ago, any hope to fund Highway 23 was, any, was dead in the water. Even local fill-in-the-gap leaders were skeptical. In two years, we funded the Corridors of Commerce program, which has allowed $1.5 million to do an environmental impact study. And just recently, this week, $800,000 was awarded to, uh, for purchase of land, land purchases so that now the gap between New London and Painesville 
will be step one is checked off, step two is checked off, and when uh, the 2015 legislation returns and a transportation bill is hopefully passed, uh, we will be shovel ready to start that, that event. I'm running to, to return to St. Paul to make sense of the common sense approach to guiding our students uh, for future jobs that need to be filled now, not in four years. With our good legislation that we just passed, we are assessing our students so they understand their abilities, their talents, and their interests. And then we are guiding them into the, the positions that need to be filled today because there are a lot of job skills gaps that we need to fulfill. Also, we need to pay attention to our three and four year olds and get them off to the right start into kindergarten so that we do not have to take care of them in the middle to the other end of their high school careers. I'm running because we have a failed mental health system. When Wilmer sends four ambulances out of state in a matter of 24 hours due to the bottleneck in the system of Minnesota, we put Wilmer or our community at risk. Work needs to be done there. I'm also running to help small businesses. Due to lo our legislation in the last two years, starting October 1st, Amazon is now collecting Minnesota's ta sales tax. Minnesotans will not be using our local businesses for a dressing room and then going home to buy online without having to pay think about sales tax. I want to, ex to expand on saving small businesses money, like the legislation when we cut unemployment tax for approximately $150 per employee, or that equates to $346 million throughout the state of Minnesota. It's the biggest tax cut for business in state history. I'm Mary Sawatsky, your state representative. I'm a special education teacher, a mother, a wife, a volunteer for in Candy Oye for 30, for 30 years. And I have walked to, um, to hear from many of our constituents, and, I, and I'm here to learn and send your voice, your message to St. Paul. All right, thank you, Mary. All right, now is your opportunity to call us and ask your questions at 1-800-726-3178 or email your questions to yourtv at pioneer.org. Please try and get your questions in early because we have been getting a lot of questions. We will try and get to as many as we can. Uh, and now we are going to take a short break so that the volunteers can take your questions. We will return in a few minutes to start. Thank you. Thanks for watching Meet the Candidates on Pioneer Public Television. After this short break, we will return to the question and answer portion. We encourage you to call in or send your questions by email to the studio for the candidates to address. Have you ever wished that you could schedule your favorite TV shows when you wanted to see them? Good news. You can enjoy hundreds of hours of your beloved PBS programs when you want and where you want to watch them. Hello, I'm Paula Kerger, President and CEO of PBS. Thanks to the support of viewers like you, your PBS station can fit in the palm of your hand. And the best part is, you're the director of programming. Have a craving for great drama? The program will begin when you say so. Want to finish it later tonight? It will be there waiting for you. Now you can curl up with your tablet or laptop or smartphone to watch the great programs available only from your PBS station. Choice? convenience, and quality content delivered on your schedule. It's innovation made possible because of viewers like you. So please, call in or use your favorite mobile device to go online to pledge your financial support. Do it now. And thank you. What makes a good frontline story is really the ability to go to the heart of a difficult issue, to tell it with some intelligence and complexity, to do what most of television doesn't do. Frontline and public television is one of the last places doing this kind of work. We've been doing this job for 25 years and people have come to trust us because we answer to no one but you. People are looking for more light and less heat. Washington Week viewers are going to get it straight ahead, and that's what they count on us for. When we do these road shows, it not only helps me, but it helps all of our panelists to find out what is really on people's minds. We want to let you know what the information is, and then you decide what you want to think. That's what I think is unique about public broadcasting. There's nothing else like it out there.
there's no program like the PBS NewsHour. It's been on the air for more than three decades. The NewsHour is always going to take you deeper and take you broader. That's even more essential now than I think it ever was. Now, what we're able to do is to take it to the next step, to coordinate even more closely with what we're doing online. And we're finally in the position where we can expand our franchise to the weekend as well. PBS NewsHour Weekend is kind of a natural evolution for the Monday to Friday program. The world is more complicated than it's ever been. People have more access to sources of news than they've ever had. And what the NewsHour does is it tells you not only what happened that day that digs a little deeper. Night after night, seven days a week, we're consistently different than what the audiences get on broadcast television. There has to be a destination where you can get the information and it's still going to take you someplace you didn't even know you wanted to go. That's the news hour. We return now to our question and answer portion of the program. We encourage you to become involved by sending in your questions by phone or email. Thank you for calling in your questions. Please continue to call in questions during the debate, and we will get to as many as we can. We are, of course, now on to the question phase. Each candidate will have two minutes to answer a question with the opportunity for a one-minute rebuttal. And we will start with the first question going to Mary. Mary, what can be done to sl slow the spread of invasive species in Minnesota lakes? This is a very economic uh, situation that we are facing in Kandiwai County uh, with the th third most amount of uh, boat accesses in the state of Minnesota. Minnesota will be, uh, Kandiwai County will be receiving uh, a lot of money to help eradicate and slow down this, the, uh, species, the uh, spread of invasive species. Uh, it seems that weekly we're hearing new lakes and rivers and waterways are being infested with the zebra mussel and as well as this fall now as our lakes are pulling, uh, people are pulling out their docks and boats for the season and we're uh, finding and searching for any uh, spread of muscle, zebra mussels. Um, the legislature in the last two years found uh, or recognized the important need of supporting aquatic invasive species or AIS and making sure that we are being responsible in, and uh, taking care of our, our lakes. Um, I'm afraid it's not a matter of if but when our lakes are infested, will be inf infested. We've done a lot of good work in the legislature. We have funded the University of Minnesota with research monies to help um, uh, find ways to eradicate or slow down or stop uh, invasive species, not, and not including just zebra mussels. I did tour the U of M research facility a couple of years ago, and uh, they're doing some, uh, a lot of good work. However, there's more work to be done. We also have put down in the bottom, bottom line of the budget $10 million for in the budget line here next year on out to, uh, to our counties. Kandiwai County right now is forming their board and setting up how they are going to, to um, use that money and, and in what ways that we can stop um, the, the spread of zebra mussels and then to appropriately uh, use the funding that, that the state has provided. Thank you. Dave? Um, I agree with Mary. This is a very serious issue that we're having in Kandiwai County. Hey, this is where the lakes begin. Um, I'm in hospitality. I'm in tourism, have been my whole life when I've uh, been in business and even before I arrived in Candiaway County. Um, evasive species is a big deal, and we need to take it seriously. Um, I concur that we've got to make sure we manage these lakes as best we can. We've got to identify which ones are infested, which ones are in trouble. Um, my big belief is that we've got to be uh, on top of research and development. Before we go out and waste a bunch of money, um, sort of haphazardly, to try to Stop the, stop the transfer of, uh, of some of these things on certain landings, we've got to have a better plan of how are we going to stop it all. Um, we've got to make sure that we talk about uh, finding out what's going to kill the zebra mussels, finding out how we're going to control these before we just start throwing money and hoping what sticks will stick, but it's, it's still wasting money if we don't know exactly how the outcome is going to be. I will be a proponent for finding good research and development. I think that's where our efforts should be at this time. Um, you know, we are lucky also in Candiaway County that the city of Spicer, the uh, Candiaway County commissioners, uh, the local DNR office, we have got a great 
collaboration going right now, probably one of the strongest in the state of Minnesota, about fighting this horrible creature that has, uh, has found their way into our beautiful lakes. And we need to find the best way possible that makes sense, that we can actually have an impact without just throwing out a lot of money and not having a, a real good, precise plan of how we're going to knock these little critters out of here. So it's a big deal, and I'll be uh, very much supporting research and development in this area. Thank you. Mary, would you like a rebuttal? Yeah, uh, I, I hope you're not suggesting that the U of M is um, not being um, responsible in the monies that we are appropriating. Uh, the U of University of Minnesota is, has uh, a wonderful uh, reputation in uh, their research and development and as well as uh, knowing that a lot of those folks are intimately involved in personally and um, educationally want to s stop this horrific um, in infestation. Uh, this, this is going to just capitalize on uh, our resorts, our tourism, our shops, our grocery stores uh, if, 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 we, if, if it continues to spread at rapid pace and so we cannot uh, be, we, have, we cannot be frugal in, um, in our uh, development in, in research. I think we need to make sure that, we, that our researchers are understanding that we do support them 100% and that uh, they need to go ahead and maybe think outside the box as well, as well as uh, looking around the, the country for some of their ideas too and to share some of the, their ideas on how to stop uh, aquatic invasive species. Thank you. Dave, would you like a rebuttal? Just a quick one, yeah. My point was simply that let's pour more into the University of Minnesota because I think those are the brains of our, of our solution. And so my point is that I think that we have a great uh, facility, uh, a great university with the research and development like the university only has. I'm actually suggesting let's go more into it. Let's put more effort into the research and develop, into, into research and development. And if it, it's the U, it's all about the U, then let's figure it out before we just go all out to our 10,000 lakes or uh, two or 3,000 that might be infested, let's find a plan and make it work. Thank you. Dave, do you support all day kindergarten? I do. I always have, and I'm really happy to say that uh, Wilmer in the, in the school district that I'm probably most closely related, related to is, have been having that for a number of years now, a few years. And I'm, I'm proud that they were able to put that together. I think early childhood is very important as an employer I want the best education for our kids. And I've seen that uh, when you invest younger in children, it is better on the, on the tail end. Uh, so I'm, I am in favor of all-day kindergarten. I think that um, uh, we're finding a way to fund it. A lot of the schools already had found ways to fund it, and now they've got some extra money to do some other things with. But uh, overall, early education is good. I think the three- and four-year-olds is also a good plan. We just need to make sure that we find the right source of funding we have to make sure there's balance with everything that we get and also about education when it comes to the early stuff we just have to have the best teachers we can possibly have and we've got amazing teachers already in our, in our districts uh, and I'm looking forward to how this new uh, programs are going to start working out with our, our future employees uh, down the road. I'm excited about early education. Thank you. Mary? Well I voted for all day kindergarten and I, that probably was the highlight of, of the session for an educator. Um, Wilmer Public Schools, for example, has had all day, every day kindergarten for the past several years, but it caught, came to a tune of $350,000 that our uh, school district had to cough up to fund that. Now, we know we, our school district realized the importance of making sure that we do educate our young kindergartners, and so I applaud them. But it also is one of those things where if Wilmer did it, ACGC had to, uh, it kind of felt like they needed to do it. New London Spicer, KMS, McRae, all the schools around. Now that kind of gets to be the, the big guy runs the show and then the other uh, school districts that probably have maybe a harder time coming up with that money uh, to compete with a, a different, another school district. But I'm proud to say that we have funded all school districts in the state of Minnesota. It is about time. Uh, but we also, uh, kindergartners are I amazing because they're, it, as, if you follow education, kindergartner education is almost looking like a first grade education in, in years past. So what we started to do last year was with our four-year-olds, we could identify our four-year-old program and, and identified some scholarship monies for those folks that were having, uh, that are not up to speed as they enter kindergarten. I would like to expand that program to three and four-year-olds. We know how we can, we can identify them early 
and we can um, uh, make sure that we can get the right skills, the right tools to those young folks. And Wilmer has done an amazing job already with the collaboration of, uh, with the United Way programs, um, the Grillmobile, where they go into the community, into the parks, and, uh, and, in, and it was fun to be able to go and watch with um, uh, some of our local or our higher leaders in St. Paul to show what the great collaboration that our, um, our community has done for our three and four-year-olds. Thank you. Mary, are you in favor of keeping the minimum wage law as it is? What changes would you make, if any? Minimum wage was a huge topic in St. Paul, and, I, and I, that was one of the issues that my opponent feels that I did not listen to him with, and to the degree that he wanted me to listen to him at. <laughs> and um, um, so, with saying that, minimum wage. We all want people to be independent. We all want people to be able to have a, uh, go to a job, afford their houses, feed their kids, uh, and live good, productive lives. When we have minimum wage set at what it was, uh, many folks couldn't afford to go to work at minimum wage, have daycare, and so we're breeding the, a perpetual problem. What is easier, what, not what, it's probably not what they wanted to do, but, we'll, but having to find outside sources to help support their families. So, yes, I do support minimum wage, and by the time our minimum wage wasn't in, um, enacted, three other states have raised their minimum wage to $10 or $10.10. .10. Right now, Seattle's minimum wage is $15. Now, I'm not proposing that we uh, jump ahead to that, but the, our federal government is also investigating minimum wage standards. My opponent is very concerned about a training wage, about um, kids under, or students, or child, uh, people under 16 or 18. We've done all that. We fixed all that. We put that into the bill so that we do have a training wage. We have a, a wage for, 16, for 18 and under. So uh, I think that we did a very uh, uh, transparent, bill with minimum wage. I think it empowers families. It empowers uh, uh, more people to make more money. And when you make more money, people are going to spend more money in our community. And, uh, you know, we are, we, it's, it's an interesting thing when, as individuals, schools, uh, businesses, when we need to put more, uh, when the food shelves are getting empty, well, um, and more people need to go to the food shelf to help find that um, the needs that they need to make, um, it's time that we improve on minimum wage. Thank you. Dave? Uh, minimum wage is a uh, <clears throat> very important item for me. Um, uh, minimum wage is something that, again, uh, Mary and I talked about a lot. Uh, when I first sat down with Mary after she won her election, I asked her uh, very carefully to say, when you have any issues you want to talk about to me, because I'm a small business operator, I would like to be a resource for you. Please come and talk to me. And I really wanted to make sure she knew that she could rely on me to give her the good information so that when she makes decisions uh, in, 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 uh, in the business world, private sector world, that there's something that she is unfamiliar with, that I wanted to give her that information. We've had, and we had a lot of conversations about that. And, I, and again, I, I, uh, I'm concerned that minimum wage in Minnesota, um, it is what it is. I, I also said to her, it should go up. 6.15 an hour was too low. I really promoted to get to at least the federal minimum wage. Uh, even above that would have been acceptable. But the, the whole minimum wage issue is about balance. And if we don't balance things like minimum wage, taxes, and everything that we have to decide on, it pushes everything up. So in my example, my restaurant, if we push minimum wages too high, we've got tipped employees that are not recognized as getting uh, extra income by Mary. And so my concern is, as we keep pushing up the price of my hamburger by another 50 cents or other services that I need to cover the new labor um, costs, it could cause problems for my server that now doesn't quite see as many tables throughout the day. And so it, my, my fear is that it could have a negative effect because maybe they went a little too far. But you know, today minimum wage is what it is. I support it. I don't have any plans at this point to make any changes. We're going to work within the parameters of what's given and we'll move along, but uh, minimum wage is a very uh, important issue to Minnesota. Thank you. Mary, would you like rebuttal? Yes, I would. Uh, yes, we, my opponent and I had several conversations, and it was quite interesting. Out of all the restaurant owners in, the, in Candy Eye County, uh, Dave was the only one who called me, and I sought out others. So other restaurant owners, uh, hospitality owners, uh, 
did not call me personally about this issue. Um, I do want our listeners to understand that I did vote for Dave on the TIP credit. In 2013, Dave asked me to vote for TIP credit. Um, I do not support TIP credit, but because uh, I valued what he had to say, and I wanted him to le earn my trust in um, understanding that I am listening to him, so I did vote for TIP credit. I do know a little bit about small business. My brother, when he was 19 years old, he bought his first restaurant, or er, bought his first drive-in on Highway 212 in Granite Falls, Minnesota. My father was a small business owner. Uh, I do know, I have worked in small business. So I, so I think that, if I may reboot mm -hmm. again, um, again, and I, I had mentioned to Mary that I appreciated her hearing it. It's actually not called tip credit any longer. That's an old word. It's a two-tiered system. It's a two-tiered uh, minimum wage. And I think it's important to recognize that even after that 2013 vote that she did take, which still didn't pass, um, and, and nothing, uh, all the minimum wage kind of held over into 2014. Um, she voted um, totally uh, how her party did in 2014. So the, the two-tiered wage uh, vote that she took in 13 did not happen in, in 14. And that was disappointing to me very much because I thought she kind of understood what was important to me and our industry. And it just didn't seem to happen. So, Thank you. Dave, do you support recreational marijuana, medical marijuana, or none at all? What damage do you anticipate could be done to our communities through legalizing marijuana? Um, I think that the legislature last year did a good job with what they were dealing with. Um, as a father uh, and, a, and a husband and a, an employer, um, I would never support recreational marijuana. This is not at all what the, the, the legislature did. I think they're trying to help people that are dealing with chronic pain, and, and they've been... Um, showing good signs that this medical marijuana um, pill and, and how they're prescribing and how they're administrating this is a good thing. I think with the restrictions that, the, that are in place, it's something that can work. It's early stages of how it's going to work. They're still working out the kinks. We'll have to see how it goes. Um, I guess I can live with what has been um, proposed and what's actually in law now. We'll just have to watch it closely. But if I have anything to say about it, recreational marijuana will never take place as far as... Uh, I'm concerned if I have anything to say about it. Thank you. Mary? Recreational marijuana um, is, um, let's start with medical cannabis. Uh, the legislature put medical cannabis into a box, and I'm comfortable with the box. I am a special education teacher, and I understand the needs of uh, folks that have um, it, situations where that it will relieve pain and uh, chronic, chronic pain, chronic issues, and uh, and to enhance your life, uh, a better life, and to to in help you with uh, understanding uh, the the qualifications and the and the expectations of what we are expecting from the legislature in in appropriating our local distributaries. And um, I I just it's a very difficult issue. Um, as a special education teacher, I, I struggle with, with the medical cannabis, but I also understand that uh, with the box that we have put around it, the, the qualifications that um, in, it's doctor prescribed and it's very prescriptive, that um, I can live with medical cannabis. Uh, as far as recreational cannabis or recreational marijuana, it is a um, topic that I, I was actually at a conference for legislators and I was visiting with the folks from Colorado and uh, the legislators there said you know let us figure this out first there's a lot of there's a lot of problems we have there's a lot of issues um, with um, safety there's uh, we don't have a lot of statistics yet so uh, they're just saying wait let us work it out and uh, I will appreciate that because I uh, do not think that Minnesota is ready for um, recreational marijuana and I do not support that at this time as well as many of our mental health uh, facilities and um, experts. And um, I'm very concerned about the growing mind, um, just like it with alcohol, uh, you know, the age is 21. All right. Thank you, Mary. Uh, and Mary, this is a, an email we have from a viewer. I am wondering what the candidates think should be done in regards to our transportation, both regionally and statewide. That's a... Uh, the, the topic that I'm glad that we're going to talk about today because 
Uh, transportation is um, regionally and statewide is an issue that we need to be talking about. We have $50 billion worth of needs in the next 20 years, and we don't have the money to fund it. And so we need to have a balance, and we need to have yet we need to have a vision. And um, with transportation, with roads and bridges locally, uh, we have a lot of needs. Um, in again, I will reiterate that last year, through the Corridors of Commerce program that we set up, we were able to fund Highway 23 between New London and Painesville, and then Painesville and uh, 94, $1.5 million for an environmental impact study. With that, that was step one. Just two days ago, Governor Dayton awarded our area $800,000 for a uh, purchase to, land, uh, to buy land for um, acquis land acquisition between New London and Painesville. That's step two. Step three is to pass this bill so we can actually move dirt to, to um, expand those two lanes to four lane highway. It is an economic move. It is a safety move. It is um, a business move that, that we need to make sure that, we, that people understand that spending money on our roads and bridges is, is uh, gonna benefit small businesses, large businesses, the small contractors uh, and and those folks also with the jobs at, with actually building the, the highway. Um, quarters of commerce is something that we need to continue to fund and uh, make sure that we are, and, and that is also helping to find other high needs areas throughout the state of Minnesota. We've been talking about Highway 14 for 50 years and finally that is getting some work done as well. And Thank you. Dave? Education. <clears throat> I'm ready to jump in and talk about education if I'm duly elected. Um, I'm sorry, education, transportation, excuse me. Um, uh, I'm very excited about Highway 23 almost being completed. I'm actually um, really excited about the work that the people have really done that I think have gotten us to this point. And those are the folks uh, that sit on the Highway 23 task force, the folks like Bob Doles who should be getting the credit instead of the folks sitting in the, in the seat at the legislature now. I mean, let's give credit where credit is due, and those are, there, there's, there have been a great task force of people working hard on this. I think even before Mary started running for office or thinking of running for office, back in 2008 when I was on the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors, I supported a nickel gas tax to help our transportation funding. It is going to be short. We have to do better. And back then, I even supported the Republicans overriding the governor's veto because it needed to be done. Now, today, the nickel, nickel gas tax is not keeping up. So we've got to find some new ideas. It's going to be a balance. We've got to do some uh, uh, efficiencies with MnDOT. I think they're doing some good work there. They're doing some good things. I think Commissioner Zelli is a good man for the right job. He's going to find better ways to do it. And I also know we have to look at new revenue sources. What they are, I don't know yet. We have to get in there, find out what kind of budget we're looking at. But we also need to know that we have to start right away. We can't wait any longer for these roads and bridges enhancements. We do need to work on that. That is definitely a uh, priority for us in the business sector and in, in leisure and hospitality. We want good roads, good bridges, but it's also about balancing out what goes to light rail, what goes to metro, and what goes to rural. I really want to promote strong rural roads and, and, and good bridges and safe uh, shoulders, but it's all about what's the balance here. So efficiencies, new revenues, I'm ready to get to work on, on transportation. Thank you, Mary. Would you like rebuttal? Yes, I would like to rebuttal. Uh, I remember when I was uh, first put on transportation policy committee in St. Paul, and I did speak to one of the leaders on the fill the gap on 23, and I remember him saying, yeah, it's never going to get done. And he was giving up. He was absolutely giving up. And if you've ever been around the Capitol, and knowing whenever I see Representative Hornstein, Senator Dibble, Representative Ronnie Earhart, who actually opposed or over, overrode, or when Governor Plenty in 2008 vetoed the uh, transportation bill, Representative Ron Earhart was one of the rep, rep, uh, Republicans that voted against him for towards a gas tax. He is now the sitting legislator in the Demo on the Democrats in the transportation uh, chair. So uh, building coalitions is what it's all about, and we're building coalitions with Highway 212, Chaska. I've been to the governor's office to, to fight for this continued project for Highway 212, Highway 23 from Duluth to I-90. Thank you, Dave, would you like a rebuttal? 
Yeah, just it's all about bringing folks together, seeing what our budget is. Um, um, also with the efficiencies of MnDOT and how important it is to look at ju not just raising taxes and raising revenues. I hear very little about Mary looking at the expense side of the thing, but it's also about uh, finding efficiencies and how can we make more roads with less money. A local contractor in our area actually did a project up by Alexandria uh, here two years ago and they, were, they would have been able to save 5% or $380,000 in a $9 million project. So they would have been able to save the state taxpayers almost $400,000 on one project if they would have been able to haul more gravel and get uh, their bigger trucks more loaded with gravel. The, the roads are ready, the axles are on the trucks, we can do this. It's a 5% savings. We can do more with less if we allow the permitting and the regulations to be lowered so that we can get more savings and save the taxpayer money and have some great roads. Thank you. Dave. How will you keep jobs and residents from leaving this region because of the tax climate changes that affect both business and individuals? Well, that's um, something that is near and dear to my heart. I think that that's one of the things that has me most concerned with having a complete runaway train with the DFL in control. If you don't have business folks that really get it, that are actually making decisions, the outcome is going to be what we just saw. The last priority that the legislature had in the last couple of years has been retaining and growing private sector jobs, not government bureaucracy. It's going to be really important that we find a way to make sure that we stop these crazy permitting and the delays in, 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 in uh, permitting and regulations. There has to be a better way. We've got to make sure businesses know that we want them to grow here. We don't want to make it harder for them. By increasing the tax on the, on the most successful people, is having a negative effect. In our community of Wilmer and Kandiwai County, accountants are telling me that clients are looking at the numbers. They are going to make decisions, and a large number of them have left. And so the, the concern is uh, they're always, they, were, they were already paying a higher amount, but when you are taking that extra stuff, that extra income that they were working with to, to provide research and development in their companies, maybe it's more income for the 401ks, it's buying new equipment, but what we're doing is we're taxing the most successful people higher and without even saying, man, we sure appreciate what you do. Some of them have decided to leave. My fear is in about five to 10 years, we are gonna see a real negative effect by pushing some good, successful people and eventually some future jobs will leave with them. They're still here today. We're not gonna see the effect of this thing for some time. So I'm concerned the job attitude and job philosophy on where it all begins has to be with private sector jobs. We need a state that's going to be friendlier and more um, uh, collaborative with our private sector folks that can make those kind of things happen. Thank you. Mary? With the government shutdown in 2012 and borrow money from the schools, we ran, or I ran, on asking the wealthiest 2% to pay their fair share. That was transparent. I did that. I said that that's what I would, uh, that I would do. Um, since Governor Dayton has been in office, January 2011, 162,000 jobs have been created. Since March, 12,800 jobs have, have developed, 7,000 of them in the private sector. The Mayo Destination Medical Center has created, will create 40,000 new jobs. The Mall of America expansion, 100 jobs. 3M, with their research and design lab, $150 million, uh, will be providing 700 jobs. We also funded many things to help our small businesses stay uh, or be more successful. $30 million for Minnesota Investment Fund, $23 million for a job creation fund. My bill, I opened three new trade offices, one in Brazil, South, South Korea, and Germany. The, the Brazil... Um, uh, the Germany uh, ex, uh, trade office actually in the first quarter of this year has reached five billion dollars in exports. We also invested in the angel investor tax credit to help our businesses. We funded a sales tax exemption for capital equipment and in 2013 19 Minnesota companies are on the Fortune 500 rankings. That's second to, can, to con, con, uh, Connecticut. So um, 
we've also did a lot of things with permitting. From 150 days, we have 97% of the uh, permits that are coming through are getting uh, processed within 90 days. Yeah, we have some work there. We would like to do more, um, reduce that 90 days. So I would like to go back and help um, with uh, some more work on our um, permitting and streamlining. Thank you. Rebuttal? Yes, certainly. Um, uh, one of the questions that I have for Mary is that when we had a, uh, a debate here a few weeks ago uh, with the Wilmer Lakes Area Chamber of Commerce, she had mentioned what her priorities were. And her priorities then are, and I think they still are today, it's mental health, it's transportation, and I think it might have been education. And then she made the comment, and then the jobs will come. My concern is if, they, if she's putting it in that priority, which is what she's done uh, in, in the last couple of years, jobs weren't that important to her. She doesn't get how big of an impact it is on everything that we do in Minnesota. So I hope that, that folks are seeing these things that are going to negatively affect us and that can't be, uh, we cannot have a, a, a vibrant Minnesota if jobs, private sector jobs are last. That is not the priority that we have. We have to make sure the jobs are going to be here while we make these changes. I'm here to make sure the private sector is going to be healthy. Mary? When, I, when we invest in transportation, that creates jobs. When we invest in education, that creates jobs. When we invest in our people, that creates jobs. Now, if you're going to open a, a business here and not take care of how we're going to get people to that business. For instance, we want young people brain, brain power to come back to rural Minnesota. If we don't have the amenities, if we don't have the fast roads, if we don't have the good roads to, bring, to, uh, to uh, attract our young people so that they can go back and forth to more amenities that they want in other parts of the state, uh, we, we need to be concerned about that. And I think that, um, that when we are investing in people, when we're investing in roads and bridges, when we're investing in education, all of those things are encapsulized with um, jobs, all supporting all of those things. It's all in one. I don't think you can talk about one without the other. This is probably a broad question, but we'll see if we can tackle it, starting with you, Mary. Did you or would you have supported the last tax bill? I did support the last tax bill, and I supported the last tax bill because the legislature before me borrowed money from schools, and there was we needed to pay that back. When we haven't had funding, when schools haven't had funding since 2002, and, it's, and certainly haven't worked with our, or haven't considered inflation with that, uh, we needed to start thinking about what we haven't done. Now, I believe that when we educate people, that will create, that, that we need to educate people in order to do their jobs well. We need to not be borrowing from our three and four year old programs, our kindergartners, our first through 12th graders. We needed to take care of our people. In, um, and so what we did was we asked the wealthiest 2% who are making, as a couple, of $250,000 to uh, have uh, the same tax rate as anybody else in the state of Minnesota. Do you know that when we froze tuition for our college students uh, because, for the last two years, and I would like to go back and do it again for another two years, but because of our young people having such huge bills, loans to pay back, that is having an impact in our society of $83 billion on the housing market. 414,000 young people are not purchasing homes annually because of their large loans. That is an economic concern. And with an $83 billion industry that is not being taken care of, um, and uh, I think that that is something that we need to, again, look forward to in the future. And um, so, yes, I did raise taxes. And uh, do I want to do that again? N no. We have to be transparent. We have to be responsible. Thank you. Dave? Do you want to raise taxes again? And the answer was no. I've never heard that from uh, Mary's lips before in my life. This will be, this will be interesting. Mary is proud of her tax bill, and, and like rightly, show, uh, it rightly shows. But there are certain elements in the tax bill she doesn't want to keep talking about. Um, we did have a $600 million shortfall. 
uh, in our 2013 session, and they raised taxes by three times what was needed for that. Some money went to schools. I get that. I'm okay with that. Uh, they could have filled in the hole a lot less, but to put on a $90 million Senate office building for part-time senators, I don't understand the rationale of that. They could have rented space around the Capitol during the renovation. That is badly needed. And what's concerning to me is now we have a big office building that the citizens of Minnesota have to maintain for many, many, many years, and this is going to be another burden on our load. So it doesn't make sense for me to do that kind of a tax and spend. It just doesn't make any sense. Also, she approved throughout her whole tax and spend kind of a thing, uh, $26,000 in bonuses to people that were working on Minsure. It hadn't even been released yet, and they're paying bonuses. And I don't understand the concept of rewarding people for work that had not been proven out yet. So there's a lot of things there that, that I'm concerned about with, with they can't wait to get back to St. Paul because their work is not done yet. What my fear is, and history is the best predictor of the future, is they are going to raise three times what's needed to figure out how to get this project done. Well, let's, tr let's go triple because we've got to make sure that we have some extra. The problem is this is taxpayer dollars. We've got to make sure we use those dollars wisely, carefully, and I want to see legislators of both parties look and see what's going on on the expense side, where can we trim back, where can we find some savings, and then let's look at the last resort should be raising taxes. And that's my, my plan. <clears throat> Mary, would you like a rebuttal? Nobody ever wants to raise taxes, Dave. I don't either, but when we are put in a corner where we haven't taken care of people and we haven't taken care of education, uh, then we need to look at some other extremes so or in other avenues. I do want to say that the Senate office building, thank you, Republican Representative Dean Erdahl, for being a champion for wanting to restore our capital. It's a beautiful building. So we're restoring the capital. We're putting bathrooms on the first floor for women and handicapped. We are making, uh, uh, we are adding elevators to the, to the uh, capital, which will take away space for our senators. And also we're making more room for our constituents to come in and participate in the legislative process. Now, we are part-time in St. Paul, but our staff is not. Our staff is there 12 months, and when our constituents have a problem and a need, we need to go someplace for the staff. They are displaced. So now what is going to happen is a $77 million capital building or Senate office building is being built and, the, and the, um, the parking lot will be generating revenue because the senators are paying for their parking spaces. Dave? Again, I think everybody is in agreement that the capital renovation needed to take place. But from a common sense approach, there was over 200,000 square feet of rental space available around the Capitol that we could have, as citizens, rented temporarily for two years. It would have been awkward. We would have had buses. We would have had shuttles. But, you know, there's a lot of smart people that would have figured out the logistics of this. But now we have a big, beautiful, new, shiny building that's going up right now. And we are going to just enjoy the tax burden of this for a long, long time. And, again, you know, Mary, even on the House floor, if you, if you want to look it up on YouTube, but Mary is defending the $90 million office building on the House floor, I find that appalling how she, our representative here in District 17B, is just defending it to the very end about how this beautiful parking ramp is so badly needed. I want to encourage folks to go check it out. I was, I was shocked when I saw the video online. All right, folks, we are down to the last question. We only have a little bit of time, so let's hope we can get this one answered. Can you, as a state legislator, do anything to discourage employers from hiring undocumented workers? Dave, that we will start with you. You know, um, I actually like a lot of the rules that we have in place. I'm an employer. Nobody can work for me unless they show the proper documentation. I have to follow the steps. I have to submit them to the state. I think there's a good plan in place now. We've got the documentations. No one, no employer should have to uh, go through the no one should skip the steps of doing this. I don't care who you are, what you are, if it's part of the legal process, if it's been approved with immigration status, if it's been approved with the temporary status of, of, uh, of working visas, it has to be following, following the law. That is an area that we have to protect our citizens that want to work here. Americans come first. Minnesotans come first. We have to make sure that we follow the documents. For me as an employer, this is an easy one. We need to follow the rules as they are 
prescribed and uh, keep looking at them to make sure that we're not missing something important. Thank you, Dave. Mary? The checks and balances are there. They need to show uh, when they apply for a job uh, their documents, um, documentation. Uh, when we are talking about this, there has been discussion at the legislature last year about having um, uh, a driver's license or an identification card for our, uh, for our um, minorities. And uh, there's a lot of discussion, and I think it's going to come back to, to the table this year as well. And quite frankly, if there was, if we were, if they were given an ID card uh, that looks, uh, and um, driver's license ability, we were going to have more chances or opportunities to be able to track who these people are, and um, it will help them and employers um, uh, be able to um, know who's who's there and who's um, applying for our jobs. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to everyone who's called in this evening. We uh, were able to get through many of the questions, but not all of them, and I apologize for that. We now will move on, move on to the closing remarks, and we will begin with the Democratic candidate running for House District 7B, Mary Swatsky. Mary? Well, I want to return to St. Paul to bring back the message from the hundreds of people that I have talked to at the doors and your work at places of work. Um, it's the voice from both Republicans, the re voice from the Democrats, it's the voice of the independents. It's the voice of those that don't really understand or want to be engaged in, in politics. But I always say, I'm not there to be a politician. I like to bring good policy and make good policy. I want to bring back the voice from Candy White County in greater Minnesota. And so I'm the vehicle that goes to St. Paul to bring your ideas, your concerns, and your thoughts to St. Paul to make good policy. We need to invest in infrastructure, and that means infrastructure of people, roads, bridges, uh, broadband, infra, uh, internet system, education, and of course, commerce. Uh, we need to, uh, I need, to, I want to be that effective person who collaborates in St. Paul and create collaboratives and coalitions. Uh, we, we all can't be, if we have 134 leaders, uh, nobody's following, nobody's coming together to bring, bring in small coalitions to have ideas of maybe thinking outside the box. We need to have a, a, a well-rounded legislature that listens to each other, that listens to the left, that listens to the right, and listens to the middle. As Confucius wrote, if your plan is for one year, plant rice. If your plan is for 10 years, plant trees. If your plan is for 100 years, educate children, and invest in, in our society. So thank you very much for tuning in today, and it's been a pleasure and, a, and a very, a very much an honor to be your representative for the past two years, and I look forward to uh, the future in uh, the House of Representatives for 17B. Thank you, Mary. And next we will hear the closing remarks from the Republican candidate, Dave Baker. Dave? Thank you very much, Amy, and it's been a pleasure to be here tonight. Thank you, Mary. I always do enjoy the discussions because when our voters can hear from the, is the issues directly from the candidates. It's always the best. All the clutter that we're getting in the mail and hearing on the radio, there's just so much clutter. So every time I visit with somebody at the door, I want to make sure they know, what is Dave Baker like? What do I do for a living? And once I get a chance to kind of tell them who I am, they really seem to sort of like, ah, that's what it is, because it, it really is a lot of clutter. Um, again, I'm a, I'm a Republican that can see the middle. I'm somebody that will not promise you that I, I won't raise taxes because it's not the way you do things. I'm a common sense guy. I've learned how to do things in business and I want to take what I've learned in business I'm a, uh, and, and take it to a level that, that I think I will be very good at. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a leader that likes to sit down with people and listen. I collaborate with people. I've got many examples of things that I've done as a collaborator in our own community. I can't wait if I have the opportunity to get to St. Paul to do some bigger and grander things of what I think I can do as, as well for growing our state, making it healthy, making it the very best Minnesota that we can have. I've been born and raised in Minnesota. I love Kandiyohe County. I think this is a wonderful place to be. I would love to be your representative in 17B if I have that opportunity, but I'm somebody that gets it. I'm common sense. I will not vote 94% with my party like Mary has. I, I know that my Republicans don't want to hear that all the time, but I am a balanced person because a lot of good ideas come from Democrats and a lot of good ideas come from Republicans. What, what our constituents want here is balance. 
They are just yearning for balance. And that's what makes the two-party system work well. When you've got one party in plan, in, in the whole thing, it doesn't work. There's, it's wide open, and we need to slow it down. My name is Dave Baker, and I would love to be your representative. And thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Dave. And that concludes this evening's program of Meet the Candidates. Thank you for joining us this evening. Please join us again next Thursday when we will meet the candidates from District 8B at 7 p.m. and District 8A at 8 p.m. On behalf of Pioneer Public Television, I'd like to thank the candidates for joining us this evening. I'd like to thank all the volunteers here who have assisted us. But most importantly, I'd like to thank you, the viewers, for tuning in and participating. Remember, your voice is important. Make your voice heard by voting on November 4th. Good night. Thank you for watching Meet the Candidates. We hope that you have gained useful information that will allow you to make an informed decision on election day. On behalf of Pioneer Public Television, thank you for watching.